All right, so we're starting an entirely new word. Uh, it's one that's obviously very important to us. It's the word faith. And I'm probably going to give you a couple of Old Testament, which will be Hebrew forms, and I'll give you a couple of New Testament. Now, when we talk about this, let me I always try to give you some sort of illustration. So the root word for faith is pronounced exactly like it looks, amen. And that's probably the Sand Mountain Hebrew version, but it seems to me it's pronounced all man. But it comes in nouns and verbs. And when English works right, it's super helpful. It makes sense because we kind of go by roots too uh, sometimes. Uh, for instance, if you take this word as a root word, there's all kinds of words that you can form out of this word, but you kind of know what it means even if you didn't know English. For instance, if we put this in front of it, you kind of know what that means if you know what the root means, right? Uh, if you did this right here, kind of know what that means and I didn't you know you're still working off the root and there's a whole lot of other words that you could work with that stabilizer uh, well maybe not a whole lot <laughs> my mind's not working now but we've worked through what three or four and we're working kind of off the same root right and so when you see that up there don't throw up your hands I don't obviously don't want you to learn that word because I might be able to pronounce it this week, and I wouldn't be able to pronounce it that way. It's not important. I just want you to know it works the same. And when you talk about, in, I told you faith comes in nouns and in verbs, obviously the verb is going to be more important to us because we have responsibility to exercise faith in God. So the verb is going to be more important, right? We have something to do. And their verb works similar, not the same, but similar, just like we have Past, present, and future forms of verbs, they have their forms of verbs. And really, there's only one form of verb that's useful in faith, and here's this form. Again, pronunciation is not important. What is important is it works very similarly to English. So this is going to take this, ah man, it's going to take this root, he's going to change it into a verb, and he's going to put it, it's a perfect tense, He's going to put it in a, a tense that becomes very important because it becomes a, an issue of responsibility. Something is necessary for us to do. Now, obviously, you're familiar with Genesis 15, 6. The Lord's talking to Abraham. And we see this amen in this verb form in 15, 6, where it says, Then Abraham believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it or credited it to him as righteousness. So this was... This is like the key Old Testament passage for salvation. This is where Paul writes the book of Romans. He bases it off of Genesis 15, 6 because he wants us to understand faith is credited to us when we trust in the Lord. Now, just off of that passage, you could. there's a lot of things that you can say about believe based off that passage. Number one, to gain stability because what was Abraham so worried about when God told him this. Is this not right after the deal where he had to go and rescue Lot from those other kings? And not, not 15. I'm just worried about how old he was. Turn to Genesis 15. Uh, who wants to read? Cody, thank you. Read 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram also said, since you have given me no son, one who has been born in my house is my heir. 
Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come down, come from your own body shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look towards the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall, be your, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So what was Abraham worried about? Having a son. He didn't have a son. And we've talked about this a number of times. Not only did he not have a son, but it was absolutely impossible, physically speaking, humanly speaking at this point, for him to have a son, right? I don't know if you've ever spent the night awake, filled with anxiety over something concerning your kids. Perhaps you have. If you haven't yet, you will soon. But you got to realize Abraham was at that point in his life where, okay, my inheritance and this promise and all that's got to be passed down to a son and I don't have any kids. And so it was very anxious moments for him. So when we talk about it to gain stability, you can see how that word works in that sense because all of a sudden my heart settled back down. I'm not filled with anxiety. God's given me a promise and I choose to trust in that promise and I fall asleep. So he gained a stability when on the inside he was just like an earthquake going on. Couldn't find a footing. He was so worried about this issue. So you can see where they kind of get to the definition of this particular word. But you can also see the second part to consider a message to be true. And that comes into the realm of his own responsibility to actually trust what God said. He had to hear the message of the Lord and he had to firmly determine in his heart that what God is saying to me is true. And if what God's saying is true, I don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to have a son, and I need to get prepared for having a child in my life. Right? And so you take all men, you put it in the verb form, and Abraham exercises this, and all of a sudden he considers what God says to be true. Now where you and I come into the realm of salvation or will we bring this soteriologically into our understanding is when God says what I've done through Jesus Christ is sufficient for your salvation if you repent and believe in what I have done in my son you will be saved it works exactly the same way it might be two different promises <clears throat> Abraham was going to have a son and here we believe in God has sent his son in order to save and we rest in that I I'm no longer working I'm no longer trying to gain the favor of God I'm no longer trying to be accepted by God. I simply have heard what he said he has done for me through his son on my behalf, and I trust in that. That's faith. We rest. We rest. And it's not Jesus plus, because it's Jesus plus. You're not resting. You're working. You know, if it's Jesus plus baptism, if it's Jesus plus circumcision, if it's Jesus plus a good person, ah, da, 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 da. you're not resting. You're still working. That's not faith, right? So we see how it means to gain stability. We see how it means to consider the message to be true. But ultimately, what is faith? You're trusting in a person to do what they said they would do. So it rests on the character of God. And we've, we've come back to that so many times walking through this on Wednesday night. Abraham rested because he said, you know what? I know God. He's absolutely trustworthy and true in all that he does. He's perfectly good in everything. What have I to worry about? nothing right and so that's ultimately no matter what you're dealing with in your life if you want to talk about exercising your faith it really doesn't matter the issue because the only concern is are you going to rest in the character of God or are you not you know you may be out there I need a promise I need a promise why do you need a promise do you not understand the character of God I mean the more I grow in my faith the less particular I've become with God I don't necessarily need particulars because I know the person. And if you know the person, I'm not concerned about the particulars. He'll take care of the particulars, right? So you can kind of see how we take this word and we study a passage, and all of a sudden you can get a very clear understanding of definitions of words because of how they're used in a context. And Paul is going to develop the gospel message based off that passage. So it's nothing, you know, Paul didn't make this stuff up. He studied the Old Testament. And it's perfectly consistent all the way through. Our faith in Christ is just like Abraham's promise to have a son. 
Now, uh, there's, there's like 103, okay, there's 103 usages of this word in the verb form, and I, I'm not going to give you all that, okay? But it's interesting that if you slightly change the verb form, look how it's translated, nurse, then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and became his nurse. Exact same root word, different verb form, but you can see how it's consistent in its definition. Because if you hand a child over to someone to care for that child, are they trustworthy? <laughs> well, if they're not, you're not going to give them the child. You know, if they're going to take care of the child, you can see how that word, like we use the word stable, you can see how this would be in this root because you would need a nursemaid tending a child to be absolutely trustworthy in everything that they do. Unquestionable character, right? So I'm just kind of showing you, not everything's going to help us in salvation if you just look at that word. You've got to use the right verb form, but you can still see context helps you understand a word. I, I find it fascinating that King James, King James, ESV, NASB, everybody translates this word nurse, but it's built off the word of faith. And, of course, they look at the fact that Naomi was going to act like a mother to the child, and so they translate it nurse, but there's a lot of other words that I might translate that because I understand what a mom does, and I understand what faithfulness and trustworthiness looks like, right? So anyway, this is just, I'm just showing you how we can kind of play around with words, and you still learn a whole lot. Um, this is what Zimmick said. This is a really good paragraph here. If you can't read it or see it, I'll read it to you. It says, Faith does not evolve from doubt to trust. A man has either committed himself to God our Savior or he has not. And faith in the person, if genuine, will be followed by faith or trust in his word. Abraham's faith included the negative renunciation of his own ability, I can't have a child, and his positive reliance upon God. There's a whole lot going on here, right? Part of Abraham's faith was, I can't do it, but I know God can. And when you come to faith in Christ, what you're saying in effect is, I can't save myself, no matter how good of a person I am, but I know God can do it, and therefore I trust. So there's a negative and there's a positive working, right? But he puts it this way, it doesn't evolve because you're either on or off. You're either born again or not. You're either in light or dark. You're not evolving in faith. Either you've trusted in what God has said or you haven't trusted in what God has said. And of course, one of the things that we consistently say around here, no matter who's behind the pulpit, if you've trusted in the person of God, you have to trust in the word of God because if you don't trust in his word, you, you don't really trust in his person. Right? So I thought those were very helpful comments to understand this. And, and again, it comes back to responsibility, right? We're not evolving. Either there's been a place and time in your life where you have firmly rested on what God has said about His Son, Jesus Christ, or there has not been a time in your life where you've rested in that truth. Which is kind of remarkable to me for a hundred-year-old man, roughly, to go to bed one night and sleep like a baby because he trusted what God had said, you're going to have a son. That's amazing to me. But then again, you and I went to bed one night after the Lord had dealt with our hearts, and we knew we were saved, and we rested, knowing that God had saved us. It's pretty amazing when you get to think about that, right? All right, here's some other, these are just usages. You can kind of see how they form. I thought these were interesting because these are quoted in the New Testament. Isaiah likes this word, obviously. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in that stone will not be disturbed. I think it's Peter who quotes that. And of course, he's talking about Jesus Christ as the stone. Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. 
You're trusting in what he says, trusting in who he's provided. Again, it's consistent, but it's always the same verb. Which it was interesting to me. Amen into this perfect form, and it becomes what we understand as faith. Here's a passage from Jonah. Of course, you know Jonah preached the gospel, a very abbreviated version. And then in Jonah 3, 5, Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called to fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Uses that language. They heard the message from Jonah, and they trusted in the message, and they repented and believed in God. Psalms 119 the psalmist writes, teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. So now you can kind of see theology forming in the New Testament because if you believe in the word of God, then what will you do with it? Cody. Believe in the word of God, you'll live it out. Yeah, you'll live it out or you'll obey it. I mean, it's, it's simple math. If you believe the word, you'll obey the word. If you disobey the word, you're struggling with unbelief. Right? Which is a passage in 1 John. All right, so here's how, you know, we take the word stable, right? And you put an un in front of it, and all of a sudden you took that root and you made it no longer stable. And so here's this word, and I told you last week, you learn a lot from the negative, so it turns it into unbelief. And you can see very clearly what not having faith looks like. It says, The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? Okay? So there was a time where God got fed up with the Israelites, and he called it unbelief or unfaith. I know that's not a word, but it helps you see what I'm talking about. God is like, these people have no faith in me. How much do I have to do for them to trust me? And of course, Numbers 20 is a very sad moment. Uh, one of the most difficult in the Old Testament. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed in me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So where was it that Moses exercised no faith in God? When he struck the rock. How many times did he strike that rock? One too many. One too many. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, you could think a long time on this because this is the word for unfaith, no faith. God says, strike the rock and give the people water. Moses was mad. He smacked that rock twice, and God says, that's unbelief. You're just like, whoa, what? And God was like, that is no faith. Therefore, you will not go into the promised land. Man, that's tough. But God explains that later. But anyway, it was very important for Moses to always exercise faith in God. And when he struck that rock twice, God was like, uh-uh. That's no faith at all, Moses. So you're telling me that God means what he says? Apparently. Okay. <laughs> Apparently. But to go beyond that would be yeah. Yeah. lacking belief. See, we want to be so, in, of course, let's carry this into the gospel. Moses didn't lose his salvation. That's not what God's talking about. But let's carry it into the gospel because we're so inclusive with the gospel because we want to include every, everything that calls itself Christian, right? You, everybody wants to include Mormonism into being actually saved or actually converted. You can't do that because you're going way beyond what the gospel message clearly says. You're doing more than smacking that rock twice. You're beating it half to death just because they know the name Jesus. They're not listening to what God says about his son, Jehovah's Witness. There's no difference, right? And we could go on and on and on down the line. We always want to be so inclusive with everybody. Well, I'm sorry, if you disregard this message of the gospel in any way, you're exercising no faith in God. And so you've got to be very careful to understand the gospel. That's a, the most important message there is, right? 
All right, turn to Psalms 106. There was more I could get on a slide. Psalms 106 is kind of a summary of the history of the children of Israel. You can imagine it's not very pleasant. Um, But he uses this word in a negative context twice. And I really should have marked it in my Bible, but I didn't. Um, All right, let's start with the positive. Verse 7, Psalms 106, verse 7. I'll read it quickly, and I'll pause where we see the word. All right, Psalms 106, verse 7. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. Remember all the plagues. They did not remember your abundant kindness, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea and dried it up. He led Israel through the deeps as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of the one who hated them, Pharaoh, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy of the Egyptians. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed, here it is in a positive, then they believed his words and they sang his praise. Verse 13, they quickly forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness. They tempted God in the desert, so he gave them their request and sent wasting disease among them. When they became envious of Moses in the camp and of Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and engulfed the company of Abiram. And a fire blazed up in their company, and the flame consumed the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a molten image. Thus they exchanged their glory... For the image of an ox that eats grass, they forgot God their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wonders in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Then they despised the pleasant land, and they did not, here's the negative, they did not believe in his word. And I could keep reading, and there's also another negative in there. They did not believe. But the picture that's being painted is God is talking, and the people are responsible to hear what God is saying and exercise faith through their obedience. And if they refuse to exercise obedience, God says that's unbelief. That's no faith. Like when he brought them to the the edge of the promised land. And those guys brought back, you know, the grapes that were so big and all the fruit and all this stuff and telling them how awesome it was. And, but one of them said, well, yeah, but there's giants living in the land. And then all the people rebelled and said, we're not going to go in there. They're, they're going to kill our children. And God was like, I gave you this land. It's yours. Go take it. And they're like, no, we're too afraid. And God says, that's no faith. That's unbelief. I've spoken to you and you disregarded what I said. You said it can't be true and you walked away. So you see this word again, and it helps us understand when we roll into the New Testament what genuine faith is. We hear God, and we accept what He says is true, period. And that's why this, this demands, this absolutely demands that we interpret the Bible grammatically, paying attention to verbs and all this business, and it also demands that we interpret the Bible literally. Why? Because it's important to understand what God says. And if the only thing is to understand what God says and to exercise faith, the only possible way you can handle the Bible is not allegorically, not mystically, not weirdly with some preacher getting up there closing his Bible and ranting for 45 minutes, but clearly explaining what God has said in His Word. Because it's your responsibility to hear this and put your faith in this. And so the only thing that you want is, I just need you. I don't need, I don't need the dog and pony show. I don't need the jokes. I don't need all this stuff. I just need you to speak clearly and tell me what God's Word says because my responsibility to accept what you're going to say as from God as true. It's just like I go to the, me and Cody go to the store, right? And Laura's giving him a grocery list, but he forgot his reading glasses and he can't read his phone. 
And he knows when he gets to the store, he, he better get everything that Laura wants because if he gets home and he doesn't have it, he's got to go right back. But he's got to trust in me because he forgot his glasses. So here I'm going to read the list to him. How should I read that list to him? Allegorically? <laughs> Mystically? I know she wrote a whole gallon of milk, Cody, but I think she probably means Nestle Quick. So just grab some Nestle Quick, go home, it'll be fine. No, if I'm going to be a friend, which I probably wouldn't be, but if I'm going to be a friend, I'm going to read that list clearly. And I'm going to be very careful that it's accurate because it's his responsibility, right? And so if you're ever up here teaching or preaching, it's not your responsibility to be cool, to be a great speaker, to be entertaining. It's your job to be clear and explain what God says because it's your responsibility to trust in what God says. Read your Bible that way. It's not hard. It's really not. Just read it that way. And then go, okay, I'm going to trust in this. Because that word demands it. It absolutely demands it. All right. Moving on to the second word. Any questions about that in the verb? Because I'm about to change to a noun. Same word, but in a noun form. All right, not as many passages. I didn't include as many, any, as many verses. Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. And technically, we would probably understand that as faithfulness. Again, this is a passage that Paul's going to quote in explaining the gospel. The righteous man will live by faith. So what can we say about the righteous man? What does he do with God in his word? He keeps it. It's simple. It's a simple equation. The righteous man hears God's word and he keeps it. He obeys. Uh, this word in the noun form speaks of sincerity, faithfulness, reliability, stability, qualities which relate to a person's inner attitude and the conduct it produces. Okay, for those of you who have ever had more than one child, do you have that child when you tell them something, you know they're going to do it? They're just humble of heart. And then you have that other child, right? You can tell them 12 times, and it ain't going to happen still, right? They're just not going to do it. You can kind of see how this word is used because we need to be like that child who hears from his heavenly father, and the father knows, I ain't got to worry about it. They're going to do it. Might take them a little bit. They're going to wrestle a little bit, but they're going to do it because you don't want to be like the child who doesn't hear, who doesn't care, and no matter what you say, they're not going to obey. Okay? Kind of help you understand that word in the noun form. Uh, batak. This is a totally different word. Yeah, I just gave you one passage on the noun form there. So this word I'll go through much more quickly. Uh, batak, I think. Nathan can probably do Hebrew better than I can. Uh, here's the definitions. To feel secure, to be unconcerned. It tells you the reason that you feel secure to rely upon someone or something. In many places, it's used in a negative sense. So rather than stable, it's unstable. Y'all with me? It's another word. We translate it like faith. But most of the time in the Bible, it's got the no faith, the un in front of it. Okay? So here you go. Uh, let me skip that context. Bucket 2.18 what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. So faith is refusing to trust in what? Idols. So we've taken this word that's translated faith and they've used it in the form, I know this is not a real word, but they've used it in the form of unfaith. And so God's going to teach us a lot of things that faith is not. So if you're trusting in your own abilities or specifically here, if you're trusting in the gods that you've created, you don't have faith. Now let me tell you where that speaks to us today because many people have taken the name Jesus 
and they've created their own Jesus. Because Jesus just loves everybody that does anything. Right? He's accepting. He doesn't judge. That's more typically the American Jesus. Okay? That's your idol that you've created. That's no faith. Okay? I'll run through them quicker. Hosea 10, 13. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you have, here's your word, trusted in what? Your way. That's no faith. You either trust in God's way or you trust in your way. But if you trust in your way, that's no way. Because that's not faith. Job 31.24 I have put my confidence if I have put my confidence in gold and called fine gold my trust. So what was Job saying many people trust in? Their money. Right? Do y'all feel a lot better when you've got tens of thousands of dollars in your checking account than if you have a few hundred dollars in your checking account. See, this one becomes a real challenge. We've got to really be careful and always check up, right? God tells us in a number of places, don't trust in that stuff. It will disappoint you. Psalms 49.6, very similar. Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches... Psalm 62, do not trust in oppression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. So the same principle is taught all three of these passages. Don't trust in your wealth. Proverbs 11, he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like green leaves. Here's one that's different. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. Some people trust in important other people. They want to put their trust in people rather than trusting in God, and we can't do that. Deuteronomy 28, It shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout the land, and it shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. So what did they trust in? Their military might. The height of their wall, they felt comfortable. But God's like, I'm the one that brings comfort. Yeah, you know, here, Here's where this plays into a role. Sometimes we get so fearful about the things in this life. And you know, I wrestle with this sometimes, having two kids on the road constantly now. You get so fearful, right? You're thinking, well, if I was a millionaire... I'd buy them that Mercedes SUV that, man, that thing's a tank going down the road just to keep them safe. Then you have to remind yourself of this passage. You can trust in fortified vehicles if you want, but I'm going to choose to trust in the Lord my God. Right? You can trust in locked doors and loaded pistols at night if you want to, but you'd be much better to trust in the name of the Lord your God to protect you. See, that's where it comes down to. Got to be careful. I think... I think this is the last one. Um, Jeremiah 5.17 communicates the same thing. They will demolish with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. Proverbs 3.5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I'm convinced that like 90% of the people in hell, well, it may be actually 100, will trust in their own understanding rather than what God's word has told them. I guess, I guess I can change that. Proverbs 28, 6, He who trusts in, not with, but in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. You don't trust in your heart. It's corrupt. It's for you. We trust in the name of the Lord our God, not our own heart. We trust God with our heart. We don't trust in our heart. Uh... This is the last one. Today they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. That's the positive of that word. Psalms 25, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. 
So in other words, you sit down to study this stuff, and that's the last slide and we'll start praying, but you sit down to study this stuff and you can say with your mouth, I trust the Lord. But you also have to examine your heart because you may have just said that with your mouth and not your life. You may actually be trusting in your own abilities, your own income, your own circumstances, your brains to manipulate things. You may have a list of people you like to call that can change the world in a moment for you. You know, you really have to evaluate everything and determine, am I trusting in the Lord? And there's where you have to rest. And I know that probably opens up a lot of questions in your mind, but you just have to wrestle with those in prayer. All right. Anybody? Questions, comments? Comments?